Lord Dies by Agatha Christie Audiobook 6x13 She lay back in her chair and laughed and laughed. It's so funny, she gasped gasped. It's so funny to be asked that. That hysterical laughter had not passed unheard. The door opened and Miss Carroll came in. She was firm and efficient. Now, now, Geraldine, my dear, that won't do. No, no. Hush, now. I insist. No. Stop it. I mean it. Stop it at once. Her determined manner had its effect. Geraldine's laughter grew fainter. She wiped her eyes and sat up. I'm sorry, she said in a low voice. I've never done that before. Miss Carroll was still looking at her anxiously. I'm all right now, Miss Carroll. It was idiotic. She smiled suddenly. A queer bitter smile that twisted her lips. She sat up very straight in her chair and looked at no one. He asked me, she said in a cold clear voice, if I had been very fond of my father. Miss Carroll made a sort of indeterminate cluck. It denoted irresolution on her part. Geraldine went on, her voice high and scornful. I wonder if it is better to tell lies or the truth. The truth, I think. I wasn't fond of my father. I hated him. Geraldine dear. Why pretend? You didn't hate him because he couldn't touch you. You were one of the few people in the world that he couldn't get it. You saw him as the employer who paid you so much a year. His rages and his queerness didn't interest you you ignored them. I know what you'd say, everyone has got to put up with something. You were cheerful and uninterested. You're a very strong woman. You're not really human. But then you could have walked out of the house any minute. I couldn't. I belonged. Really, Geraldine, I don't think it's necessary going into all this. Fathers and daughters often don't get on. But the less said in life the better, I've found. Geraldine turned her back on her. She addressed herself to Poirot. M. Poirot, I hated my father. I am glad he is dead. It means freedom for me freedom and independence. I am not in the least anxious to find his murderer. For all we know the person who killed him may have had reasons ample reasons justifying that action. Poirot looked at her thoughtfully. That is a dangerous principle to adopt, mademoiselle. Will hanging someone else bring father back to life? No, said Poirot dryly. But it may save other innocent people from being murdered. I don't understand. A person who has once killed, mademoiselle, nearly always kills again sometimes again and again. I don't believe it. Not not a real person. You mean not a homicidal maniac. But yes, it is true. One life is removed perhaps after a terrific struggle with the murderer's conscience. Then danger threatens the second murder is morally easier. At the slightest threatening of suspicion a third follows. And little by little an artistic pride arises it is a métier to kill. It is done at last almost for pleasure. The girl had hidden her face in her hands. Horrible. Horrible. It isn't true. And supposing I told you that it had already happened. That already to save himself murderer has killed a second time. What's that, M. Poirot, cried Miss Carroll. Another murder. Where? Who? Poirot gently shook his head. It was an illustration only. I ask pardon. Oh. I see. For a moment I really thought now, Geraldine, if you've finished talking errant nonsense. You are on my side, I see, said Poirot with a little bow. I don't believe in capital punishment, said Miss Carroll briskly. Otherwise I am certainly on your side. 
Society must be protected. Geraldine got up. She smoothed back her hair. I am sorry, she said. I am afraid I have been making rather a fool of myself. You still refuse to tell me why my father called you in. Called him, said Miss Carroll in lively astonishment. You misunderstand, Miss Marsh. I have not refused to tell you. Poirot was forced to come out into the open. I was only considering how far that interview might have been said to be confidential. Your father did not call me in. I sought an interview with him on behalf of a client. That client was Lady Edgeware. Oh. I see. An extraordinary expression came over the girl's face. I thought at first it was disappointment. Then I saw it was relief. I have been very foolish, she said slowly. I thought my father had perhaps thought himself menaced by some danger. It was stupid. You know, M. Poirot, you gave me quite a turn just now, said Miss Carroll, when you suggested that woman had done a second murder. Poirot did not answer her. He spoke to the girl. Do you believe Lady Edgeware committed the murder, Mademoiselle? She shook her head. No, I don't. I can't see her doing a thing like that. She's much too well, artificial. I don't see who else can have done it, said Miss Carroll. And I don't think women of that kind have got any moral sense. It needn't have been her, argued Geraldine. She may have come here and just had an interview with him and gone away, and the real murderer may have been some lunatic who got in afterwards. All murderers are mentally deficient of that I am assured, said Miss Carroll. Internal gland secretion. At that moment the door opened and a man came in then stopped awkwardly. Sorry, he said. I didn't know anyone was in here. Geraldine made a mechanical introduction. My cousin, Lord Edgeware. M. Poirot. It's all right, Ronald. You're not interrupting. Sure, Dina. How do you do, M. Poirot? Are your grey cells functioning over our particular family mystery? I cast my mind back trying to remember. That round, pleasant, vacuous face, the eyes with slight pouches underneath them, the little moustache marooned like an island in the middle of the expanse of face. Of course. It was Carlotta Adams' escort on the night of the supper party in Jane Wilkinson's suite. Captain Ronald Marsh. Now Lord Edgeware. Chapter 13 The nephew the new Lord Edgeware's eye was a quick one. He noticed the slight start I gave. Ah. You've got it, he said amiably. Aunt Jane's little supper party. Just a shade bottled, wasn't I? but I fancied it passed quite unperceived. Poirot was saying goodbye to Geraldine Marsh and Miss Carroll. I'll come down with you, said Ronald genially. He led the way down the stairs, talking as he went. Rum thing life. Kicked out one day, lord of the manor the next. My late unlamented uncle kicked me out, you know, three years ago. But I expect you know all about that. M. Poirot. I had heard the fact mentioned yes, replied Poirot composedly. Naturally. A thing of that kind is sure to be dug up. The earnest sleuth can't afford to miss it. He grinned. Then he threw open the dining room door. Have a spot before you go. Poirot refused. So did I. But the young man mixed himself a drink and continued to talk. Here's to murder, he said cheerfully. In the space of one short night I am converted from the creditor's despair to the tradesman's hope. Yesterday ruin stared me in the face, today all is affluence. God bless Aunt Jane. He drained his glass. Then, with a slight change of manner, he spoke to Poirot. Seriously? Though, M. 
Poirot, what are you doing here? Four days ago Aunt Jane was dramatically declaiming, who will rid me of this insolent tyrant? And lo and behold she is ridded. Not by your agency, I hope. The Perfect Crime, by Hercule Poirot, ex-sleuth hound. Poirot smiled. I am here this afternoon in answer to a note from Miss Geraldine Marsh. A discreet answer, eh? No, M. Poirot, what are you really doing here? For some reason or other you are interesting yourself in my uncle's death. I am always interested in murder, Lord Edgeware. But you don't commit it. Very cautious. You should teach Aunt Jane caution. Caution and a shade more camouflage. You'll excuse me calling her Aunt Jane. It amuses me. Did you see her blank face when I did it the other night? Hadn't the foggiest notion who I was. And Verite. No. I was kicked out of here three months before she came along. The fatuous expression of good nature on his face failed for a moment. Then he went on lightly. Beautiful woman. But no subtlety. Methods are rather crude, eh? Poirot shrugged his shoulders. It is possible. Ronald looked at him curiously. I believe you think she didn't do it. So she's got round you too, has she? I have a great admiration for beauty, said Poirot evenly. But also for evidence. He brought the last word out very quietly. Evidence, said the other sharply. Perhaps you do not know, Lord Edgeware, that Lady Edgeware was at a party at Chiswick last night at the time she was supposed to have been seen here. Ronald swore. So she went after all. How like a woman. At six o'clock she was throwing her weight about, declaring that nothing on earth would make her go, and I suppose about ten minutes after she'd changed her mind. When planning a murder never depend upon a woman doing what she says she'll do. That's how the best laid plans of murder gang eagerly. No, M. Poirot, I'm not incriminating myself. Oh. Yes, don't think I can't read what's passing through your mind. Who is the natural suspect? The well-known wicked N.E.E.R. Dewey'll nephew. He leaned back in his chair chuckling. I'm saving your little grey cells for you, M. Poirot. No need for you to hunt round for someone who saw me in the offing when Aunt Jane was declaring she never, never, never would go out that night, etc. I was there. So you ask yourself did the wicked nephew in very truth come here last night disguised in a fair wig and a Paris hat? Seemingly enjoying the situation, he surveyed us both. Poirot, his head a little on one side, was regarding him with close attention. I felt rather uncomfortable. I had a motive oh. Yes, motive admitted. And I'm going to give you a present of a very valuable and significant piece of information. I called to see my uncle yesterday morning. Why? To ask for money. Yes, lick your lips over that. To ask for money. And I went away without getting any. And that same evening that very same evening Lord Edgeware dies. Good title that, by the way. Lord Edgeware dies. Look well on a bookstall. He paused. Still Poirot said nothing. I'm really flattered by your attention, M. Poirot. Captain Hastings looks as though he had seen a ghost or were going to see one any minute. Don't get so strung up, my dear fellow. Wait for the anti-climax. Well, where were we? Oh. Yes case against the wicked nephew. Guilt is to be thrown on the hated aunt by marriage. Nephew, celebrated at one time for acting female parts, does his supreme histrionic effort. In a girlish voice he announces himself as Lady Edgeware and sidles past the butler with mincing steps. No suspicions are aroused. Jane, 
cries my fond uncle. George, I squeak. I fling my arms about his neck and neatly insert the penknife. The next details are purely medical and can be omitted. Exit the spurious lady. And so to bed at the end of a good day's work. He laughed, and rising, poured himself out another whiskey and soda. He returned slowly to his chair. Works out well, doesn't it? But you see, here comes the crux of the matter. The disappointment. The annoying sensation of having been led up the garden. For now, M. Poirot, we come to the alibi. He finished off his glass. I always find alibis very enjoyable, he remarked. Whenever I happen to be reading a detective story I sit up and take notice when the alibi comes along. This is a remarkably good alibi. Three strong, and Jewish at that. In plainer language, Mr. Mrs. and Miss Dordheimer. Extremely rich and extremely musical. They have a box in Covent Garden. Into that box they invite young men with prospects. I, M. Poirot, am a young man with prospects as good a one, shall we say, as they can hope to get. Do I like the opera? Frankly, no. But I enjoy the excellent dinner in Grosvenor Square first, and I also enjoy an excellent supper somewhere else afterwards, even if I do have to dance with Rachel Dordheimer and have a stiff arm for two days afterwards. So you see, M. Poirot, there you are. When uncle's lifeblood is flowing, I am whispering cheerful nothings into the diamond-encrusted ears of the fair, I beg her pardon, dark. Rachel in a box at Covent Garden. Her long Jewish nose is quivering with emotion. And so you see, M. Poirot, why I can afford to be so frank. He leaned back in his chair. I hope I have not bored you. Any question to ask? I can assure you that I have not been bored, said Poirot. Since you are so kind, there is one little question that I would like to ask. Delighted. How long, Lord Edgeware, have you known Miss Carlotta Adams? Whatever the young man had expected, it certainly had not been this. He sat up sharply with an entirely new expression on his face. Why on earth do you want to know that? What's that got to do with what we've been talking about? I was curious, that was all. For the other, you have explained so fully everything there is to explain that there is no need for me to ask questions. Ronald shot a quick glance at him. It was almost as though he did not care for Poirot's amiable acquiescence. He would, I thought, have preferred him to be more suspicious. Carlotta Adams. Let me see. About a year. A little more. I got to know her last year when she gave her first show. You knew her well. Pretty well. She's not the sort of girl you ever got to know frightfully well. Reserved and all that. But you liked her. Ronald stared at him. I wish I knew why you were so interested in the lady. Was it because I was with her the other night? Yes, I like her very much. She's sympathetic listens to a chap and makes him feel he's something of a fellow after all. Poirot nodded. I comprehend. Then you will be sorry. Sorry. What about? That she is dead. What? Ronald sprang up in astonishment. Carlotta dead. He looked absolutely dumbfounded by the news. You're pulling my leg, M. Poirot. Carlotta was perfectly well the last time I saw her. When was that? asked Poirot quickly. Day before yesterday, I think. I can't remember. Tout de mim, she is dead. It must have been frightfully sudden. What was it? A street accident. Poirot looked at the ceiling. No. She took an overdose of Veronal. Oh. I say. 
poor kid. How frightfully sad. N-E-S-T-C-E pa. I am sorry. And she was getting on so well. She was going to get her kid sister over and had all sorts of plans. Dash it. I'm more sorry than I can say. Yes, said Poirot. It is sad to die when you are young when you do not want to die when all life is open before you and you have everything to live for. Ronald looked at him curiously. I don't think I quite get you, M. Poirot. No. Poirot rose and held out his hand. I express my thoughts a little strongly, perhaps. For I do not like to see youth deprived of its right to live, Lord Edgeware. I feel very strongly about it. I wish you good day. O.E.R. Goodbye. He looked rather taken aback. As I opened the door I almost collided with Miss Carroll. Ah. M. Poirot, they told me you hadn't gone yet. I'd like a word with you if I may. Perhaps you wouldn't mind coming up to my room? It's about that child, Geraldine, she said when we had entered her sanctum and she had closed the door. Yes, Mademoiselle. She talked a lot of nonsense this afternoon. Now don't protest. Nonsense. That's what I call it and that's what it was. She broods. I could see that she was suffering from overstrain, said Poirot gently. Well to tell the truth she hasn't had a very happy life. No, one can't pretend she has. Frankly, M. Poirot. Lord Edgeware was a peculiar man not the sort of man who ought to have had anything to do with the upbringing of children. Quite frankly, he terrorized Geraldine. Poirot nodded. Yes, I should imagine something of the kind. He was a peculiar man. He I don't quite know how to put it but he enjoyed seeing anyone afraid of him. It seemed to give him a morbid kind of pleasure. Quite so. He was an extremely well-read man, and a man of considerable intellect. But in some ways well, I didn't come across that side of him myself, but it was there. I'm not really surprised his wife left him. This wife, I mean. I don't approve of her, mind. I've no opinion of that young woman at all. But in marrying Lord Edgeware she got all and more than she deserved. Well. She left him and no bones broken, as they say. But Geraldine couldn't leave him. For a long time he'd forget all about her, and then, suddenly, he'd remember. I sometimes think though perhaps I shouldn't say it yes, yes. Mademoiselle, say it. Well, I sometimes thought he revenged himself on the mother his first wife that way. She was a gentle creature. I believe, with a very sweet disposition. I've always been sorry for her. I shouldn't have mentioned all this, M. Poirot, if it hadn't been for that very foolish outburst of Geraldine's just now. Things she said about hating her father they might sound peculiar to anyone who didn't know. Thank you very much, Mademoiselle. Lord Edgeware, I fancy was a man who would have done much better not to marry. Much better. He never thought of marrying for a third time. How could he? His wife was alive. By giving her her freedom he would have been free himself. I should think he had had enough trouble with two wives as it was, said Miss Carroll grimly. So you think there would have been no question of a third marriage? There was no one? Think. Mademoiselle. No one. Miss Carroll's color rose. I cannot understand the way you keep harping on the point. Of course there was no one. Chapter 14 Five Questions Why did you ask Miss Carroll about the possibility of Lord Edgeware's wanting to marry again? I asked with some curiosity as we were driving home. It just occurred to me that there was a possibility of such a thing, Monday Ami. Why? 
I have been searching in my mind for something to explain Lord Edgware's sudden volte face regarding the matter of divorce. There is something curious there, my friend. Yes, I said thoughtfully. It is rather odd. You see, Hastings, Lord Edgware confirmed what Madame had told us. She had employed the lawyers of all kinds, but he refused to budge an inch. No, he would not agree to the divorce. And then, all of a sudden, he yields. Or so he says, I reminded him. Very true, Hastings. It is very just, the observation you make there. So he says. We have no proof, whatever, that that letter was written. Eh yet, on one part, see Monsieur is lying. For some reason he tells us the fabrication, the embroidery. Is it not so? Why, we do not know. But, on the hypothesis that he did write that letter, there must have been a reason for so doing. Now the reason that presents itself most naturally to the imagination is that he has suddenly met someone whom he desires to marry. That explains perfectly his sudden change of face. And so, naturally, I make the inquiries. Miss Carroll turned the idea down very decisively, I said. Yes. Miss Carroll, said Poirot in a meditative voice. Now what are you driving at? I asked in exasperation. Poirot is an adept at suggesting doubts by the tone of his voice. What reason should she have for lying about it? I asked. Akun Akun. But, you see, Hastings, it is difficult to trust her evidence. You think she's lying. But why? She looks a most upright person. That is just it. Between the deliberate falsehood and the disinterested inaccuracy it is very hard to distinguish sometimes. What do you mean? To deceive deliberately that is one thing. But to be so sure of your facts, of your ideas and of their essential truth that the details do not matter that, my friend, is a special characteristic of particularly honest persons. Already, mark you, she has told us one lie. She said she saw Jane Wilkinson's face when she could not possibly have done so. Now how did that come about? Look at it this way. She looks down and sees Jane Wilkinson in the hall. No doubt enters her head that it is Jane Wilkinson. She knows it is. She says she saw her face distinctly because being so sure of her facts exact details do not matter. It is pointed out to her that she could not have seen her face. Is that so? Well, what does it matter if she saw her face or not it was Jane Wilkinson? And so with any other question. She knows. And so she answers questions in the light of her knowledge, not by reason of remembered facts. The positive witness should always be treated with suspicion, my friend. The uncertain witness who doesn't remember, isn't sure, will think a minute ah. Yes, that's how it was is infinitely more to be depended upon. Dear me, Poirot, I said. You upset all my preconceived ideas about witnesses. In reply to my question as to Lord Edgware's marrying again she ridicules the idea simply because it has never occurred to her. She will not take the trouble to remember whether any infinitesimal signs may have pointed that way. Therefore we are exactly where we were before. She certainly did not seem at all taken aback when you pointed out she could not have seen Jane Wilkinson's face, I remarked thoughtfully. No. That is why I decided that she was one of those honestly inaccurate persons, rather than a deliberate liar. I can see no motive for deliberate lying unless true, that is an idea. What is? I asked eagerly. But Poirot shook his head. An idea suggested itself to me. But it is too impossible yes, much too impossible. And he refused to say more. She seems very fond of the girl, I said. Yes. She certainly was determined to assist at our interview. 
What was your impression of the Honorable Geraldine Marsh, Hastings? I was sorry for her deeply sorry for her. You have always the tender heart, Hastings. Beauty in distress upsets you every time. Didn't you feel the same? He nodded gravely. Yes she has not had a happy life. That is written very clearly on her face. At any rate, I said warmly, you realize how preposterous Jane Wilkinson's suggestion was that she should have had anything to do with the crime, I mean. Doubtless her alibi is satisfactory, but Jap has not communicated it to me as yet. My dear Poirot do you mean to say that even after seeing her and talking to her, you are still not satisfied and want an alibi? Eb yet, my friend, what is the result of seeing and talking to her? We perceive that she has passed through great unhappiness, she admits that she hated her father and is glad that he is dead, and she is deeply uneasy about what he may have said to us yesterday morning. And after that you say no alibi is necessary. Her mere frankness proves her innocence, I said warmly. Frankness is a characteristic of the family. The new Lord Edgware with what a gesture he laid his cards on the table. He did indeed, I said, smiling at the remembrance. Rather an original method. Poirot nodded. He what do you say, cut the ground before our feet? From under, I corrected. Yes it made us look rather foolish. What a curious idea. You may have looked foolish. I didn't feel foolish in the least and I do not think I looked it. On the contrary, my friend, I put him out of countenance. Did you? I said doubtfully, not remembering having seen signs of anything of the kind. S.I., S.I. I listen and listen. And at last I ask a question about something quite different, and that, you may have noticed, disconcerts our brave monsieur very much. You do not observe, Hastings. I thought his horror and astonishment at hearing of Carlotta Adams' death was genuine, I said. I suppose you will say it was a piece of clever acting. Impossible to tell. I agree it seemed genuine. Why do you think he flung all those facts at our head in that cynical way? Just for amusement. That is always possible. You English, you have the most extraordinary notions of humor. But it may have been policy. Facts that are concealed acquire a suspicious importance. Facts that are frankly revealed tend to be regarded as less important than they really are. The quarrel with his uncle that morning, for instance. Exactly. He knows that the fact is bound to leak out. Eb yet, he will parade it. He is not so foolish as he looks. Oh. He is not foolish at all. He has plenty of brains when he cares to use them. He sees exactly where he stands and, as I said, he lays his cards on the table. You play the bridge, Hastings. Tell me, when does one do that? You play bridge yourself, I said, laughing. You know well enough when all the rest of the tricks are yours and you want to save time and get on to a new hand. Yes, Monday Ami, that is all very true. But occasionally there is another reason. I have remarked it once or twice when playing with lay dames. There is perhaps a little doubt. Eb yet, la dame, she throws down the cards, says and all the rest are mine, and gathers up the cards and cuts the new pack. And possibly the other players agree especially if they are a little inexperienced. The thing is not obvious, mark you. It requires to be followed out. Halfway through dealing the next hand, one of the players thinks. Yes, but she would have to have taken over that fourth diamond in dummy whether she wanted it or not, and then she would have had to lead a little club and my nine would have made. So you think? I think, Hastings, that too much bravado is a very interesting thing. And I also think that it is time we dined. Un petit omelette, n-e-s-t-c-e-pa? 
And after that, about nine o'clock, I have one more visit I wish to make. Where is that? We will dine first, Hastings. And until we drink our coffee, we will not discuss the case further. When engaged in eating, the brain should be the servant of the stomach. Poirot was as good as his word. We went to a little restaurant in Soho where he was well known, and there we had a delicious omelette, a sole, a chicken and a baba a room of which Poirot was inordinately fond. Then, as we sipped our coffee, Poirot smiled affectionately across the table at me. My good friend, he said. I depend upon you more than you know. I was confused and delighted by these unexpected words. He had never said anything of the kind to me before. Sometimes, secretly, I had felt slightly hurt. He seemed almost to go out of his way to disparage my mental powers. Although I did not think his own powers were flagging, I did realize suddenly that perhaps he had come to depend on my aid more than he knew. Yes, he said dreamily. You may not always comprehend just how it is so but you do often, and often point the way. I could hardly believe my ears. Really, Poirot, I stammered. I'm awfully glad, I suppose I've learned a good deal from you one way or another he shook his head. Maze non, c-e-n-e-s-t pa c-a. You have learned nothing. Oh. I said, rather taken aback. That is as it should be. No human being should learn from another. Each individual should develop his own powers to the uttermost, not try to imitate those of someone else. I do not wish you to be a second and inferior Poirot. I wish you to be the Supreme Hastings. And you are the Supreme Hastings. In you, Hastings, I find the normal mind almost perfectly illustrated. I'm not abnormal, I hope, I said. No, no. You are beautifully and perfectly balanced. In you sanity is personified. Do you realize what that means to me? When the criminal sets out to do a crime his first effort is to deceive. Who does he seek to deceive? The image in his mind is that of the normal man. There is probably no such thing actually it is a mathematical abstraction. But you come as near to realizing it as is possible. There are moments when you have flashes of brilliance when you rise above the average, moments, I hope you will pardon me, when you descend to curious depths of obtuseness, but take it all for all, you are amazingly normal. Eb yet, how does this profit me? Simply in this way. As in a mirror I see reflected in your mind exactly what the criminal wishes me to believe. That is terrifically helpful and suggestive. I did not quite understand. It seemed to me that what Poirot was saying was hardly complimentary. However, he quickly disabused me of that impression. I have expressed myself badly, he said quickly. You have an insight into the criminal mind, which I myself lack. You show me what the criminal wishes me to believe. It is a great gift. Insight, I said thoughtfully. Yes, perhaps I have got insight. I looked across the table at him. He was smoking his tiny cigarettes and regarding me with great kindliness. See ye share Hastings, he murmured. I have indeed much affection for you. I was pleased but embarrassed and hastened to change the subject. Come, I said in a business-like manner. Let us discuss the case. Eb yet. Poirot threw his head back, his eyes narrowed. He slowly puffed out smoke. Jaime posed a questions, he said. Yes. I said eagerly. You, too, doubtless. Certainly. I said. And also leaning back and narrowing my own eyes I threw out. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.